And so we're uh, coming. Um, yeah, it's actually it's been a while since I was trying to make this presentation. Uh, since April, my name is Tim Yunusov, and today we will be talking about my name, surprisingly, yeah, and about um, paint fraud. So, and it's obviously everything in certain ways are related to upset, yeah, because essentially you will have application on cards, you will have application on point of sale terminals, you interact with, you will have applications which will authorize or will not authorize your uh, transactions. And main question personally for me uh, is where is the money? Whenever I start to, I don't know, with payment projects, financial institutions, some bug bounty in bank, uh, that's the first question which comes up, where is the money? So whenever you'll find the answer, where is the money? That will mean, first of all, that institution which uh, offered something from you, which asked you to make a pen test, they definitely didn't expect what will go behind that some sort of background processes behind this went wrong. And um, that is essentially the difference between good pen tester and bad pen tester. So bad pen tester doesn't know how to get money out. Um, another question which you need to answer as a white hat is uh, who you're trying to get money from, yeah, who is the target. So you either will try to get money out of bank itself, so it will be bank funding, or you can try to simulate to steal money from just regular customers. And for these purposes, we just open two accounts for example, I try to steal money from Lee and Lian tries to steal money from me. And um, that's how last year we decided to open four, uh, decided to open accounts in four different banks and go for the second approach. Uh, and we additionally opened another four accounts in this year. And we decided not to choose high street banks, first of all, I personally was working for too long with high street banks and they are quite, you know, slow. And um, no, uh, instead of that, yeah, I decided to have a look at these fancy digital startups, fintech replacements for high street banks, yeah, which are essentially big part of market nowadays. Um, so just a brief overview about card payments, yeah, just some sort of background. Uh, whenever you make payments with cards, uh, there are multiple instances. First of all, will be payment instrument. As I said, predominantly will be card, yeah, or mobile wallet, or everything except cash, if we are talking about uh, online payments. Then you will have payment in point, which will be essentially <coughs> point of sale terminal, uh, I don't know, uh, cash, register or ATM or some sort of online acquiring systems which will allow you to pay online, yeah? Then all your data will go to the acquiring bank and um, acquiring bank will send it via card brands networks such as Visa or MasterCard to the issuing bank. And at the issuing bank of your card, there will be authorization process which will involve multiple instances, multiple decisions. So Antifraud will have a check that you don't do transactions from some strange places, that you still have enough uh, money on your account. And if everything will go well, uh, authorization host will send uh, authorized decision back all on the chain and on the terminal you will get message, yeah, accepted here is your goods. Um, so we made the choice about uh, payment instruments, as I said, we've chosen eight banks uh, over the last year. Now it's a question uh, which endpoint we're gonna use. So there are, as I said, there are multiple choices, yeah, and all of them will have their own pros and cons. You can imagine you can't bring ATM at home. We tried first, <laughs> literally we tried. Uh, and um, second is that, for example, about ATMs, we were talking for too long for now and not too much else to say. 
Uh, let's talk about those little things. So point of sales, yeah. So it can be either mobile point of sales as uh, one we obtained last year with our research with the end about um, vulnerabilities in mobile point of sale systems, or it can be just a traditional point of sale and both of them nowadays you will find in every shop you pay with your card. And the problem is that both of those models contain remote code execution, which will essentially give you access to a payment workflow to better understand what's going on behind. So, but just in case, if you don't have access to those devices, if you can't buy a mobile point of sale or open account, there is still a possibility. For example, Visa offers um, mobile point of, point of sale simulator, which is written on JavaScript and works with traditional card readers uh, like NFC or just traditional EMV, and it fully simulates payment process and you can basically obtain exactly the same results and understand what's going on behind. Yeah, so just very easy to download and start with this. Uh, as I said, point of sale plus remote code execution is essentially an instrument, very, very useful instrument. It will give you access to implementation of EMV core, NFC core, how payment processes works. It is like seven, books of hundreds, hundreds of pages, where instead of that, you can uh, reverse the application and we'll see how exactly it works. And surprisingly, you may find uh, some vulnerabilities which you don't expect, yeah? Like buffer overflows over NFC or something like that. And you get access to a real payment workflow. You'll be able to understand what data goes from your card to the terminal, what data goes from the terminal next to acquiring bank. Uh, you can have a look at different configurations like limits, some other features of uh, terminals. And a uh, very important part of the payment process for EMV NFC and NFC is uh, offline authentication and risk management. So these two steps are happening on the terminal itself. And if you re reverse engineer the code, you'll be able also to understand how those two steps work. Uh, yeah, so here is an example of the payment packets. Uh, if you don't know, both packets from terminal to the card and from the terminal to the server goes uh, in as a called TLB encryption tag length value. So you have tags, you have a big database of EMV tags which are available online. Uh, then you'll have byte which is responsible for its length and the value itself. And um, TLB allows to have as many, as many nested levels inside of each other as possible. So in the end, if you will decode this data, you will see something like that. You'll see something like uh, table or a tree, which will contain data you pass to the terminal and then to the bank. For example, expiration date of your card, uh, current date and time, amount and currency of the payment you've made, type of uh, card holder verification you've made, for example, PIN or signature or no CVM as in, in, as in this case, uh, type of payment cryptogram and cryptogram itself and um, encrypted track to data. And um, you may have either online or offline solutions to decode this data to have a look with uh, uh, database of tags, etc., etc. So I, for example, use tvrdecoder.appspot or a special Java application if I don't want to share my data online, obviously. So now let's talk about the attacks. Yes. Yeah, so uh, three things that we've made over the last year is um, reversal and refund attacks, then chip and pin, and some card testing. Obviously, we've made much more, but I hope we'll be able to share some data later in the year. So, reverse attacks, first it was referenced in 2015 by um, British Forbes. Yeah, so what's going on? You hackers uh, withdraw money from ATM, get a receipt, 
and get uh, authorization code from this receipt. Then what's going on? Uh, you have compromised point of sale terminal, or just like any point of sale terminal, and then you make a reversal transaction with this authorization code in entry field, which says to the bank that this money will return back. Yeah, this is kind of ridiculous situation. You imagine you withdraw money from ATM and then you somehow just return it back via point of sale. Kind of strange. But anyway, if banks don't wait actually three, five days until money will go into the banking facility, yeah, and uh, instead of that allow you to withdraw money and pop up your account, you basically create money out of nothing. And that's how, yeah, in 2014 or 2015, some probably Russian hackers stolen around like four million from those banks who don't do things well. Uh, another attack is uh, sort of the same, 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 but different without ATMs. So all you need, you need one point of sale terminal. Yeah, so what do you do? You make a purchase with, for example, credit card. And then you make a refund, but you return money not on the same credit card, you return money to the different card. A lot of terminals allow to do so. What it gives you? It gives you, first of all, the ability to withdraw money out of your credit account without any fees. Yeah, so, because you can imagine you can't withdraw money from credit card without any fees by design. But with this feature, you can. And Next is that you will basically get access to free infinite credit line. <laughs> uh, so what do you do? You, for example, spend thousand pounds from your credit card. Then you have the end of the month, which says in two days time, you need to uh, return our thousand pounds. What do you do? You make payment for this point of sale terminal for another thousand pounds and make a refund for debit card. Then you send money from debit card back to your credit card. And bank sees that two days before the end of period, you actually topped up a thousand pounds back. But those, two th th those thousand pounds which you spent recently, like a couple of seconds ago, will essentially will be postponed for another 30 days, yeah? Uh, as in most of the banks that will happen and in 30 more days you'll just repeat the situation, repeat, repeat and that's how you'll get this infinite credit line. Uh, yeah, now we'll talk about chip and pin. Chip and pin attacks are very, very old. So as you can see, first reference was made in uh, University of Cambridge in 2015, in 2005, <laughs> uh, yeah, by Professor Murdoch and his team. And then first presentation was made in 2010 by a group of uh, researchers from Inverse Pass, which is now essentially acquired by XQ and uh, Aperture Labs. And uh, they all were speaking about quite like three different type of attacks on chip and pin. First of all, hackers are able to intercept pin code in plain text because of offline verification on the card itself. Then they can make transactions without knowing PIN at all. Is it called PIN OK attack? And th three is you can download card holder verification to chip and signature instead of chip and PIN. So guys on the till desk will ask you to leave signature, you will leave like anything you want and, and then go away with uh, stolen cards and uh, bought things. Uh, so what's going on here? First of all, there is uh, things which are called CVM, is a card holder verification method, is a list which is written on the card and uh, contains pri prioritized methods which bank had written on your card of preferred card holder verification methods. So it will contain type of method, conditions of use, and uh, what will happen if this method was failed. Uh, in the easiest way, it will look something like 
first check encrypted uh, pin code. If both terminal and card will support these features, then we can use an encrypted pin code for like all terminals which don't support these features, then we'll ask for signature. And if nothing will work, we will essentially cancel the transaction. Uh, there is an amazing database of CVMs all around the world on the spotterswiki.com. The main problem is that it doesn't contain uh, other conditions like condition of use and uh, what will happen if CVM has failed. They just contain vast database of CVM priority list just in plain text, yeah? And um, after 2005, payment industry obviously have decided to mitigate these risks and what they have done. They essentially added uh, more sophisticated type of offline data authentication. So offline data authentication is when terminal checks that card is actually genuine, that it's not just clone, dumb clone on Java smart card or something like that. So just they just exchange keys and um, with uh, open cryptography tries to validate that data was actually signed by secret key, which is held on the uh, section which hackers could not read. Yeah, and um, they added, as I said, the latest uh, edition of this data authentication, like the, the truly secure one, yeah, which is called CDA. When uh, older one, SDA and DDA, essentially were exactly prone to this attack of CVM tampering. Um, hackers, well, it didn't took too long to hackers to come. Yeah, uh, research from Aperture Labs were made in 2010. And in 2011, uh, one incident in France happened. So hackers have stolen 40 cars from some French bank and implemented uh, additional pin, additional chip on top of the original one, which is essentially simulate this Pinocchio attack. And with this possibility, they were able to conduct 7,000 transactions for around $700,000. Not too much, but still, yeah. Um, so it's 2019 now, and sadly in Europe, these attacks are still possible, yeah? Uh, so interception of PIN, PIN OK, and downgrading of chip and signature, so why? Yeah, after CDA was implemented, CVM should be signed. Yes, for example, guys, uh, we had some sort of conversation with these guys from inverse pass, and they were like, yeah, everything should work. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, the problem is that first of all, multiple banks contain big CVM lists by design. For example, they may have those things which I found very recently. First the rule is pin online, encrypted, everything is good. But only if point of sale terminal is unattended, means it will be on the streets or in McDonald's, for example, and all rest point of sale terminals will ask for a second rule, which will be pin offline, which will be essentially prone to pin OK or um, pin tampering attacks. Then, surprisingly, Visa cards not very often provide offline data authentication, so in cards we looked at less than 50% uh, actually supported this feature. So it's actually not mandatory. Yeah, you can, as, as, as a bank, um, you can just decide, okay, we, we, we don't see any necessity of using these features and your embossing systems will just skip this. And third is, imagine you have card which supports older uh, unsecure version of authentication, which is called DDA, and you have secure version of CDA, yeah? And terminal should support both of features. Even with these circumstances, terminal still, for some reason, can choose DDA first, and next, on different circumstances, terminal can, goes, can go online if offline authentication was failed. So if data was tampered, it still will send data to the issuing bank 
and each in bank can look and see, oh, well, at least this customer has enough money, so we can just authorize the transaction. Um, third story is about car testing. Yeah, so coming back to question to Paul about his MasterCard concerned about multiple uh, virtual cars. Probably they are quite happy about that. Yeah, so what's going on? Uh, it's quite a popular attack nowadays related to <coughs> either balance testing or car boot forcing in general. They have different names, bin master attack, credit master attack, just card numeration. So what's going on? Yeah, uh, you have service which allow you to add card. For example, Google Pay. Yeah, uh, when you try to add card to your Google Pay account, you will be authorized for zero pounds. Uh, and if during this process you won't enter right CVV or expiry date, you, well, obviously bank will say decline and you will see on the screen that transaction was declined. And with these features, there are a lot of vulnerable resources which allow not to do one operation, but hundreds, hundreds of thousands. And build brute force, card number, then expiry date, and then CVV. So once hacker have done it, they will start slowly to test your account balance. Yeah, so they will start either to increase amount of money they try to withdraw or decrease. So that is two transactions that were made like in, in one week after I left my online card, uh, my virtual card somewhere in online Dodge store. Uh, never do this. This is the case when hackers actually came first. So what has happened? In 2016, you all should be aware of this, Tesco Bank was hit by exactly the same attack. So hackers were trying to attack 40,000 accounts and they successfully have made 9,000 transactions or what, like two and a half million, yeah? Um, no one known what is this in 2016. So even as you see, task says they did not use the H word as uh, in its statement and, and, and the interview. So they actually didn't know that they were hacked. Uh, one month later, this time Newcastle University guys uh, had, as you see, quite quick research where they found out what actually has happened. So hackers make consecutive enumerations. First of, they've chosen bin, yeah, which is like the first six digits of your card number, which is dedicated for some specific banks. So they've chosen Tesco Bank bin. They, then they get access somehow to card number. Yeah, like one testing cards, they can go and open this card in Tesco Bank or they can just, for example, use some online banking registration systems which will allow to brute force and understand uh, based on the answer, which card is alive, which card is dead. Then you need to separately brute force expiry date. This is possible, for example, if you do refund transactions or if you try to send money to this vulnerable card. Yeah, so in, in both of these uh, cases, you actually don't need to enter CVV. Yeah, if, if, if you send money to someone, you don't know they're on CVV, but you will get the answer that this card, for example, doesn't exist. Yeah, if this happens on resources which get access to this database. Then you brute force CVV, uh, just during regular transactions, card not present, any type. And then, well, if you may, may be aware, uh, UK has uh, address verification systems on your card when you need to enter your postcode and um, it will check digits on it. And so to be sure that it's not some sort of fraudulent transactions, it's just an, an additional level of verification. And this also can be done by just looking at the answers from the server. So essentially you can get answer of his right CVV, but from a postcode that, yeah, every system failed or something like that. 
Uh, and, and as you can see here, yeah, in 2016, a lot of websites were prone to these attacks. And now, in 2019, even more uh, vulnerable because there are essentially so many instances which allow you to enter a card, to make card-to-card -card transactions, send money from one instance to another, and, and so on. And last year, like if, as if it would not be enough, Tesco Bank was fined for another 60 million for things that happened in 2016. Uh, but even in 2018, 2019, it's still a thing. So last year, Monza confirmed that they, uh, some hackers were trying to get exactly, to make exactly the same attack. And a lot of banks write me almost like monthly, like, oh, what is this happening? Why we are trying, like some dudes try to authorize and uh, enter just expiry date, which is different for one month from the original one. Is that all right? Is there everything all right in our system? I like, no guys. Um, last story is about float rounding operations, float rounding mistakes. Yeah, it's very, very old vulnerability. First reference I was able to find is 2001. And I've become familiar with it much later in 2013 when I started to work much closer with banks. Uh, that was presentation of Adrian Fortuna from KPMG Romania. Uh, and sadly in 2019, it's still a thing, it's still vulnerability. So you can see, for example, a couple of years ago, guys who found some things related to cryptocurrency and sadly high street banks are also prone. So for some of you who don't know, yeah, you have, for example, one pound, which is essentially cost $1.3. Yeah, if you will try to convert $0 0.02 mm -hmm. from your dollar account, to the pound account, uh, your system will have limits of two points after decimal point, yeah, of two digits after dec decimal point, which will essentially round 0 0.0153 to 0 0.02 pounds, yeah. So you already converted to, to potentially two dollars to two pounds, and then you make transaction back. So you convert 0 0.02 pounds back to dollars, and with the same operations and same restrictions, you will essentially get 0 0.03 dollars. Uh, yeah, which made us richer for 0 0.01 dollar. We rich yet? No. Uh, you need to do this at least like 10,000 times to get 100 dollars, yeah? And you will find some sort of obstacle. First of all, one-time operations, yeah, which will be required most of times. Then at some point you will need some anti-fraud systems which will start to block you, which you will need to bypass somehow. And finally, you don't want to do 10,000 operations manually. Yes, yeah, so you need to automate this somehow. Um, so for people who don't believe how real is that, the maximum amount that we were able to make with this operation was what, more than $400,000 in three days, pretty impressive, um, on the live online banking system, not the test environment. And in 2019, sadly, all banks that we have tested were potentially vulnerable to this attack, means that I've made one transaction, two transactions, earned $0.01 uh, dollar and stuck by, by this point, yeah. And only one bank asked us to confirm this, this vulnerability and uh, make hundreds of transactions, which we actually made and, and, and they obviously confirmed that they are vulnerable to this. Uh, this is a little bit out of the scope, yeah. Sometimes, as you see, you can get money, sometimes you can lose money. Uh, this is a game. So how you can lose money during payment research? 
one of banks that we, fintech startups that we opened account last year was, as they claim, startup which allows you to spend money from any of your accounts using just only their own card. Let's call it card one, two, three, four. Uh, what do you do? You uh, register your mobile application, you add your cards, any amount of your cards in this mobile application. And then when you make payment with this one, two, three, four card, they will have a look which card is uh, connected and bonded to your account, let's say card five, six, seven, eight, and withdraw money from it. So card one, two, three, four is just a proxy which goes, uh, sends information back to the bank you will choose to work with. I was thinking, okay, what if I will take card to card service and will send money from card one, two, three, four to card five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, uh, for card two, for the card five, six, seven, eight, it can be just a regular transaction, but money will return back to me. The flip side is that I will get some sort of cash back, yeah, if card 5678 is a credit card, yeah. All right, I sent 100 pounds. Five minutes later, I've lost 100, 200 pounds. So they withdrawn money once and they withdrawn money twice. And I was like, that's not good. That's not what I expected. Uh, I waited five days when money were actually cleared out of my account. So there were no pending um, record under my uh, payments. And I still had minus 200 pounds on my account. I was like, okay, wrote to support of both banks, one, two, three, four, and five, six, seven, eight. And they all were like, no, it's just regular transactions. I know, what are you talking about? I was like, maybe card to card is trying to steal money from me. No, that was a big company and obviously when I entered credentials for the second card, I didn't enter CVC, nothing. So how, how they actually were able to get money out of, out of my second account. Um, I started to do some tests. I used three different cards and three different card to card services to check what's going on. And in all of them, I've got exactly the same results. So money were withdrawn twice in every case. So as you can understand, there is only one point is one, two, three, four card. Yeah. Um, so you expect to money will be returned back plus cash back. Instead of that, you got negative balance. Yeah. I wrote article to medium and literally two days ago I got in touch with CISO from that bank and they finally returned me money back. Uh, so otherwise I would stay here and say guys do not use this facility. Uh, they are not all the same. Yeah, Some of them can withdraw your money twice, some of them are better, some of them are worse. Some of them are quicker, some of them are more secure, some of them are less. And um, the problem is that my first question, yeah, uh, where is the money, is not what the question of banks, because risk model, risk-based model actually says to bank, not where is the money, but how much money. How much money it will cost to fix vulnerability, how much money it will cost to keep the vulnerability in the system, but focus on some other stuff like design features, new features, et cetera, et cetera. And it's kind of ridiculous in the end for me in, in financial services, yeah? So imagine you have bug bounty program from a company like Google. You find vulnerability, you report this vulnerability, even if it's like with lowest CVSS or like out of scope or something like that. You will get a letter which says, thank you so much for participating in our program and so on and so on. And potentially you will get even money, which is good. And now imagine a uh, financial institution. I'm not talking only about banks. I'm talking about ATM vendors, major card uh, processing systems. Just uh, you, found, you found vulnerability, you reported it. And let's say it's some sort of medium CVSS, yeah, because we are talking about 
some reports which say, oh, there is how hackers can actually steal money out of someone else's accounts. Yeah, so it's not like information disclosure with low impact. The problem is that mostly financial institution will answer you, oh, it's not been used in a while, so we will probably just skip it. We will just sit and wait until hackers will actually start to use it in a while because there is a still a possibility that hackers want. Why the hell we need to spend money on building up sophisticated systems to protect things that never will be attacked? Uh, and in the end, yeah, these vulnerabilities, they still can be used in the wild. It's just a matter of a time when exactly they will be started to use. Um, we opened a new block, cardpayments.fail. This presentation is already uploaded. Uh, yeah, and we still have old records of our Twitter and um, yeah, just if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim.